You've heard the phrase, every company is becoming a software company. An insurance company is now supposed to turn into a software company that sells insurance. A clothing retailer needs to reinvent itself to be able to build software to manage the production and distribution of its clothing. Software applications provide so much leverage to an organization, it seems smart to develop in-house software teams to build those applications. But does it really make sense? Is there a better alternative to all of these companies becoming software companies? In the 90s, outsourcing was a common solution to this problem. If you didn't have software expertise within your company, you would hire a large consulting firm. These firms would often hire inexperienced offshore developers, and the resulting code quality was not so great. Because of the bad experiences of the first internet boom outsourcing, companies became more cautious about outsourcing their engineering work, which led to today, where the standard is to hide your own software team. The world has changed in ways that have made outsourcing a more viable solution. Programming best practices are more widely understood. There's an international community of software engineers who share information on places like Stack Overflow, Quora, and Twitter. Off-the-shelf collaboration tools make it much easier to communicate the requirements of a project to a team of developers. Gigster is a company that is working to optimize the engineering of software projects. Large enterprises come to Gigster to build new projects from scratch, whether that project is a marketplace, a mobile application, or a machine learning model. Roger Dickey is the CEO of Gigster, and he joins the show to describe how Gigster works and why it often makes sense for companies to focus on their core competency and outsource software engineering. Like this show about Gigster, some of our most popular episodes of Software Engineering Daily describe how leading software companies are built and organized. We've covered companies like Giphy and Netflix and DigitalOcean and Stripe and many others, and you can find these easily if you download the Software Engineering Daily app for iOS or Android. You can hear all of our old episodes. They're easily organized by category. And as you listen, the Software Engineering Daily app gets smarter and recommends you content based on the episodes that you're hearing. If you don't like this episode, you can easily find something more interesting anytime by using the recommendation system. The mobile apps are open sourced at github.com slash software engineering daily. If you're looking for an open source project to hack on, we would love to get your help. We're building a new way to consume software engineering content, and we've got a bunch of different projects that you can contribute to if you're looking for open source. We've got the Android app, the iOS app, this recommendation system back end, this web front end, and more projects coming soon. People are talking about a chat application that is seems to be coming to fruition. If you join the Slack channel, you can join that conversation. Uh, our Slack channel is findable by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com. And you can also send me an email at any time if you're interested in getting involved. I will point you in the right direction. I'm Jeff at SoftwareEngineeringDaily.com. And with that, let's get on with this episode, Gigster. When your application is failing on a user's device, how do you find out about that failure? Raygun lets you see every problem in your software and how to fix it. Raygun brings together crash reporting, real user monitoring, user tracking, and deployment tracking. See every error and crash affecting your users right now. Monitor your deployments to make sure that a release is not impacting users in new, unexpected ways. And track your users through your application to identify the bad experiences that they are having. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash raygun and get a free 14-day trial to try out Raygun and find the errors that are occurring in your applications today. Raygun is used by Microsoft, Slack, and Unity to monitor their customer-facing software. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash raygun and try it out for yourself. Roger Dickey is the CEO of Gigster. Roger, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you. Today we're talking about your company, Gigster, which does outsourcing, contracting for large enterprises, and 
basically it's it's a way for enterprises to get applications built for them. So I want to start by talking about outsourcing from a historical perspective. In the 1990s, outsourcing got a bad reputation. What has changed in the last 20 years that has made outsourcing a better value proposition? Great question. So we, you know, so I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm familiar with the industry, but, but also new to it. So I, I of course, wasn't in it. I should caveat this by saying wasn't in the industry in the 90s. But I, I think what, what, what we saw in the 90s was this explosion of, of offshoring talent. And as with any other, uh, any, anything else that causes, that, that it crosses cultural boundaries, I, I think there were, there were growing pains. There were natural growing pains. You know, talent overseas is pretty incredible. Some of the best engineers I've worked with have been have been Indian or Russian based engineers. But there there are a lot of challenges in the on the interface between that talent and clients. So I, I, I think I think you saw, you know, companies that can afford to pay for the best have have kind of less of an interest in consulting firms that compete on cost, right? So, you know, many, you know, companies that need something done right, they're not necessarily gonna go go somewhere that they can get it done a third or a fourth of the cost if that sacrifices the quality of the end product, the maintainability of it, the sort of total cost of ownership in the same sense that you have that for a lower quality versus a higher quality car. And and just just the general the general interface. You often you often have uh, you know I, I think what you see people often do is they'll hire agencies as sort of an indirection layer. So they'll hire a US based creative agency that can conceptualize the product. And then that agency may outsource to 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 someone else. But you know, I, I think now that overseas talent has kind of equalized in cost with with even some US based talent, we're starting to see a lot less of that happen, especially as companies care more about quality. Do you think it has anything to do with the fact that the tools we use these days are higher level, maybe a bit friendlier? It's easier to piece together the building blocks of an application today from, say, AWS and Twilio than it was back in the 90s when, I, I don't know what you <laughs> what you were using in the 90s, but I guess like Java, I guess like Java J2EE or something. Yeah, I mean, certainly higher levels of abstraction and all these all these infrastructure services have have, have been hugely helpful, and, and I think that. It kind of democratizes who can do the consulting, and it, it it raises the average quality level for sure. I think there's always there's always a frontier that's hard for companies to access that's new. So these days it could be you know your your augmented reality app, a machine learning app, some sort of data science project. I think it's probably still hard to outsource that, but mature technologies are certainly getting a lot easier to handle. Hmm. Well, you hinted at it there, but how do the contracting needs of a large company look like? Like if you're IBM or eBay, what kinds of, I mean, you're a software company. So what are the things that you want to outsource? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned both of those because those are actually both our clients. Uh, we've got about 40 enterprises that we work with. And, you know, honestly, I had the same question myself when I founded Gigster. We thought we'd be helping non-technical firms outsource. I mean, if you look at the Fortune 500, right, like how many of these 500 companies are actually technology companies? You know, maybe less than 10%, less than 50, I would say. Could be, could be 30. So you have, you have a lot of firms that, you know, aren't fundamentally technical, which represents a large market if you're bringing technology in. But what, what we've seen is that, you know, like, like you know, the examples you gave, even the IBMs and Ebays of the world have a need. And, and I think it boils down to, th- let's say, three areas. One is quite simply the roadmap. The roadmap grows faster than their technology department can consume it. So, you know, you have, you have people who need more bandwidth. Uh, and we come in and provide extra bandwidth sometimes. We simply take projects off the roadmap that they don't have the resources to execute themselves. Uh, there's always some new executive that has some new initiative. And it's the most important thing in the world. And it's more important than this other executive's initiative. Um, and there, there could be a political battle internally for resources or access to IT. We come in and essentially obviate any political battles because we'll, we'll give anyone technical resources. I think that's one. Uh, another example is speed. The project we did for IBM had to be completed in two and a half weeks, and they weren't equipped to do that internally. We 
basically came in and delivered that for them. And we, we, we spun up really fast. We spun up a team like an AWS instance, you know, just within, within days and got that done. You know, and, and, and the third thing we see is talent that they just don't have internally. You know, I was talking to a company today, a German insurance company called Allianz. And, uh, you know, they have a ton of engineers internally, but, you know, there are certain types of talent that they, that they don't have. So they might not have machine learning engineers. We'll come in and give you a team full of engineers like that if you need them. But, you know, I, I, would, say, I would say it's speed, bandwidth, or access to resources they don't have, which is the case with, uh, you know, would be the case with Allianz if we work with them. And it's the case with, with eBay, another one of our customers that need machine learning engineers. Hmm. There is a narrative that every company is becoming a software company. So if you're an insurance company, you're actually a software company that happens to sell insurance. Huh. I'm wondering to what degree you think that is the case, or should an insurance company that has increasing software needs, should they be scaling up their outsourcing, for example, and just focus entirely on their core competency of actuarial tables or probability of car accidents or something like that. Uh, yeah, I mean this this is something we talk about a lot and it's a great it's a great way to frame a common question that businesses have. I rem- I remember hearing from somebody that Starbucks Starbucks's new CEO is telling people that Starbucks is a software company, which is which is interesting because I imagine none of their customers would think of it that way. You know, but they do have software products that power supply chain logistics, customer loyalty through mobile applications, et cetera. So, you know, I think you could call a lot of companies software companies. I, I do a fair amount of angel investing. One thing that I look at with companies is I, I, you know, obviously I look at whether or not technology is the core hard thing they have to do to win. And if it's not, I have no business investing because I don't, uh, I'm not familiar with other types of businesses. So I think if you're going to call something an X company, if you're going to call something a technology company, then it has to be the case that technology is the core thing they need to do to win in the market. And, and I think some businesses that are calling themselves software companies, you know, maybe, maybe that's not actually true. Maybe the executive team at that moment in time is excited about technology. So it's sort of a rallying cry to get, uh, to get the company more, more going down that path. But I, I, I do think many companies are software companies. Any company that acts on data, for example, an insurance company, is a technology company because technology acts on data. And uh, if their competitors have more technology than they do in that realm, then, then they won't succeed. You know, you have, you have other companies that are really more about the brand, something like Nike. You know, uh, they, granted, there's a lot of supply chain, but also their brand is very important. So I think it really depends on the industry, but you do definitely see, I think you see a lot more companies these days that these these days that are technology companies and it behooves really every business in the world to have their own custom technology. Hmm. So I've done, I've, I've outsourced a, a lot of different projects that I've built because sometimes I like to just architect out an idea or do some wireframes and I don't want to write the MVP. I just want to outsource it. And I think the needs of an enterprise there, but that's, it's often the same thing. They've got a new project they want to spin up and they outsource it to, to something like Gigster. And then they have an MVP that they can work with and they can hand it off to somebody at the team. Uh, they're within their company that can manage it going forward. And I do want to talk about that with you in, in a moment. I want to talk about the process that, you know, if a large enterprise is getting something built, how they work with, with you, with Gigster specifically, uh, but just like talking a little bit more about outsourcing fundamentally and and how it might look in the future. Outsourcing is obviously getting easier. It's getting good. Something has changed relative to how outsourcing worked, in, in, you know, twenty years ago, where it has become quite a, an appealing value proposition. And you know, you know more about the fundamental economics than I do, so I'm really not sure, but. Could you imagine a world where the insurance company just says, you know what, our competitive advantage is we're really good at, at doing sales and marketing and getting customers to come in through the door, and and we just kind of like do data, we get data, 
and maybe we get most of the out, maybe we, most of our applications are outsourced. Maybe we have a couple engineers who work internally to sort of manage projects, or they're they're more project managers, but they outsource all of their engineering work. Can you imagine a world where where that might happen, where it's actually more economical rather than if you're if you're all state trying to hire software engineers and figuring figuring out a, a, an equity compensation package that's really appealing to them? You just do all of your work through outsourcing. Can you imagine that kind of world? 100%. And I think you, you were touching on that with your previous question, and I'm, I'm glad you brought it back up because I don't think I really addressed it. It's, it, you know, it's one of the reasons we started Gigster, honestly. You know, the, the vision for us is to be a central engineering department for every business in the world. We called it the world's engineering department too. And, and that's exactly the idea that technology is essential for every business, yet most businesses don't really have easy access to it. And I, I think it's the case that that great software developers are far less expensive to a business than, uh, you know, not so great software developers, you know, in the same total cost of ownership sense that we talked about before. You know, we've all talked about 10x developers and heard that idea. Well, a 10x developer doesn't cost a company 10 times more than a 1x developer, so to speak. But as a business, like an insurance company, right, that doesn't have tech as their core competency, how do you attract a bunch of 10x people? They don't want to work for you. So I, I think the future, what the future might look like is that there's one central or several central entities that do most of the engineering, and the great talent is co-located in those central entities. And companies have a thin layer of technologists, but they mostly focus on their brand, their core value proposition. Maybe, uh, maybe the insurance company really has one algorithm that differentiates them from every other insurance company, sort of like you know, the secret sauce or special ingredient that a restaurant might have that its entire business is based on. But after that, they don't really need to worry them, you know, you know, bother themselves with the details. I think we're already seeing that. We're seeing that with a lot of our customers. Even before we got there, you know, they had other companies that built most of their technology. I can't name specific names, but a lot of our customers don't really have much technology. It's sort of a skeleton crew internally. Um, it, it, it makes sense due to a few market trends. I mean, the best engineers want to work with good people on interesting problems. And there just aren't that many at some of these companies. So I think you're seeing the best engineers go build frameworks. You're seeing them go join organizations like Google and Facebook. There's definitely a rich, get richer type of dynamic, which, which really hurts if you don't have great engineers already. So building that culture, understanding how to work with engineers simply won't be the competency at a lot of these companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get a little more into that later on, but let's give people understanding for how Gigster works. Describe the process of an enterprise coming to work with Gigster. We typically, you know, somebody, somebody will reach out to us. What we try to do very quickly is understand at a high level what the problem is they're trying to solve with technology rather than get down, get down the rabbit hole of a conversation about a specific mobile app or website they want to build. Then we go from there. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll We'll do, if, if the requirements aren't clear cut up front, we'll do uh, a scoping engagement where we'll, we'll come in, we'll help them, uh, help them articulate what they want to build. We'll create a spec document and we'll give that back to them. Now they can take that, implement that internally. They could give it to a different development solution or they can hand it right back to us, in which case we'll build what they need. If they come to us with a specification already made, then we can go build that. So the way our process for development works is we need to have a clear-cut spec up front. We don't do agile work. Everything we do is uh, it's closer to waterfall. So it's, it's fixed price, scope defined up front. We allow for some reasonable flexibility during the process, but we do require an upfront well-defined scope. Then we manage the process through a series of milestones with the client. Um, our freelance developers aren't paid by the hour. They're paid by the milestone that they complete. And then we're paid by the customer, also by the milestone. So none of it is hourly based. Uh, it's not a staff augmentation model. We won't give you individual developers. Uh, we only give you an entire team. And the reason we do that is if we understand what you want up front and we have full control over the team and how the freelancers operate, we can actually optimize what happens under the, under the hood. In the same sense that with Uber, you don't, it's not a marketplace where you meet specific drivers and hire them. You push a button and the app finds you the best person. 
maybe someday the app will give you a self-driving car or it'll just teleport you. It'll do the most efficient thing to get you to your destination. We think of uh, putting a software team together and delivering a consulting service the same way. DigitalOcean Spaces gives you simple object storage with a beautiful user interface. You need an easy way to host objects like images and videos. Your users need to upload objects like PDFs and music files. DigitalOcean built Spaces because every application uses object storage. Spaces simplifies object storage with automatic scalability, reliability, and low cost. But the user interface takes it over the top. I've built a lot of web applications, and I always use some kind of object storage. The other object storage dashboards that I've used are confusing, they're painful, and they feel like they were built 10 years ago. DigitalOcean Spaces is modern object storage with a modern UI that you will love to use. It's like the UI for Dropbox, but with the pricing of a raw object storage. I almost want to use it like a consumer product. To try DigitalOcean Spaces, go to do.co slash sedaily and get two months of Spaces plus a $10 credit to use on any other DigitalOcean products. You get this credit even if you have been with DigitalOcean for a while. You can spend it on Spaces or you can spend it on anything else in DigitalOcean. And it's a nice added bonus just for trying out Spaces. The pricing is simple. $5 per month, which includes 250 gigabytes of storage, and one terabyte of outbound bandwidth. There are no costs per request, and additional storage is priced at the lowest rate available, just a cent per gigabyte transferred and two cents per gigabyte stored. There won't be any surprises on your bill. DigitalOcean simplifies the cloud. They look for every opportunity to remove friction from a developer's experience. I'm already using DigitalOcean Spaces to host music and video files for a product that I'm building, and I love it. I think you will too. Check it out at do.co slash sedaily and get that free $10 credit in addition to two months of spaces for free. That's do.co slash sedaily. I like the milestone model. I think it keeps incentives aligned so you don't have engineers purposefully taking a long time to finish a milestone they just finish the milestone as quickly as they can and then they get you know money based on that so how do you figure out how to agree on a price up front and how do you prevent scope creep because a lot of people that you're probably interacting with they're used to agile i mean i like that you that you own the term waterfall. I also like that you own the term outsourcing. I don't see either of these things as as bad words. They're kind of they've been uh, uh, maligned due to uh, just bad experiences that people have had. But tell me more about how you figure out what the price is going to be when a company comes to you and they're like, "Hey, we want to do Project X," and you're like, "Okay, it's going to cost X," and here's the milestones that we're going to break it down into. And how do you prevent the scope creep? So, so this is one of the areas that our core technology comes in. We've, in a sense, we've mapped the software genome. So we understand when a new project comes in, we tag it with different details and we understand what features it's made up of. Uh, so project has various meta variables, like what technologies it uses, whether it's a rush job or not, what, what platforms does it have to integrate with existing customer technology? And then it has a list of features, you know, photo upload, a settings page, a landings page, a feed, comments, likes, you know, e- each, of, each of these could be different features in an application. And we tag a new project that comes in with these features. Uh, what that allows us to do is uh, find similar past projects. And we've, we've done thousands of projects for clients. So we can actually find very similar projects. We can look at data and how those went. And this data comes in from GitHub, from Jira, from Trello, from Slack, from, you know, whether it's communication, project management, or source check-in. We aggregate all this data and we can get an understanding of how the project went, use that to predict the optimal time and price for future projects, and we've gotten to a point where that we're actually very accurate. So we've, uh, you know, we're, we we attain our margin probably 98, 99% of the time on projects, which which is which is pretty stunning, but it, it also something that's structurally possible given our model. Hmm. 
how much do you talk about that margin? How much the developers are getting versus how much Gigster captures? Is that confidential? Yes, it is. It's it also really just depends on the project. Mm. The margin is very low on some projects because we we need to redo work or we have a lot of internal company resources like customer support that have to heavily support our freelancer base. You know, and in, in other cases, it ends up being higher if we're able to reuse code assets across projects. So it's it's really highly project dependent. But the reality is, what we do for our freelancers is we take on all that risk, so they can just essentially write code and get paid. Mm. We try to make it the easiest possible experience for them. Mm. So it's an interesting model for how the client is interacting with the developers that are writing the project. So let's say I am a company. A uh, big enterprise, and I come to Gigster because I need this machine learning application built. I say I've got all this customer data, and I want a machine learning algorithm that's going to predict whether this customer is going to churn or not. Here's kind of the data. Here's what I'm looking for, and the customer, sorry, the the enterprise that you're dealing with will actually interface with a project manager, and then the project manager will manage the engineers on the Gigster side. So the engineers actually don't ever interact with the enterprise that's coming to Gigster as a customer. Is that accurate? That's right. Most of the, in uh, most, most cases, uh, you know, our, our engineers, one of the reasons they work with us is they don't want to interface with clients. They could join another freelance network and they could work directly for clients in a staff augmentation type arrangement. But our engineers like us, because we have that indirection layer, we protect them, we make sure they're paid on time, the project manager is is typically a freelancer as well, although we do also have internal resources that oversee the whole project. So really, it's an entire fully functional freelance team where all of the development resources are, uh, you know, kind of indirected from the customer with with that project manager. Hmm. That's always been our model, and it's 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 a it's a bit essential, you know, to to have that uh, that kind of quality control that managed service layer to make sure that we're able to hit margin, given that we're guaranteeing a fixed price. Hmm. Wait, so why is that so important to, to hitting the margin? I don't quite understand that. Because if, if, if the client was working directly with the developer, what we might see is the client randomizing the developer, scope creeping the project, right. trying to get the developer to do extra work that wasn't part of the original project plan. Great developers don't want to also have to do project management and uh, you know debate Feature creep with clients as they're as they're building what as you know as they're building a project. So, project managers are this line of defense in a way mm-hmm. where if the client comes in and tries to change the requirements or if the client uh, you know doesn't like a deliverable, the project manager can you know kind of kind of insulate the the development team from that. We've you know we our project managers have to push back sometimes. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes we try to over deliver for the client. But it's it's nice to have that layer in to make sure that someone's watching budget. Mm. Makes a lot of sense. So the project managers or pro- product managers at Gigster are they managing multiple projects concurrently? In some cases, they are. We have project managers that manage up to I would say eight projects at once, something in that range. Yeah. We have others that manage one or two projects, and others that are between projects. Uh, maybe their their full time gig has them busy. They've got a startup or a small business or a family issue on the side. So we, we, we don't mandate that they work any amount. As long as they're able to do a good job, they can be on as many projects as they like. Mm. So that's one thing I was, I was interested in is how, the, how Gigster itself scales as the number of projects scale. So if you, if you just have uh, in, if you had uh, you know, a linear increase in the number of projects that were on Gigster, I guess the the number of project managers or product managers that you would add would scale sublinearly because the every additional pro- project manager can probably manage multiple projects. So you probably get some economies of scale there. Can you talk more about the economies of scale that you get as you get more clients coming in the door? Absolutely. You know, I think I'd say some are on project management, others are around development and quality assurance and, and other areas. The, the way we think of, so I'll, I'll kind of zoom out a little bit and then I'll talk about, and I'll answer this directly. The way we think about kind of work automation, I'll say, or, uh, you know, this future of work concept of work automation or finding economies of scale with groups of many workers 
is we look at the software development life cycle. We take the SDLC and imagine, imagine a matrix where the columns are phases over time of a software project. So you have pre-sale, kickoff, early, middle, and late development milestones, handoff and maintenance. Those you can imagine each one of those is a phase. And then rows would be roles in the software development process. So development, design, project management, product management, QA, et cetera. Um, each cell in that matrix is the work that a certain person does at a certain period of time in the project, right? So uh, for, for, for early milestones development, you could imagine a product that gives engineers a template so they can start working more quickly. So that, that tool or, or that, that, that technology feature that, that then augments that person at that phase, and that, that saves us time, saves us money, the client gets a better result and they get it faster. So as much as we can, we look at patterns in the data, you know, inside of certain roles, inside of certain phases. So one, one economy of scale when you have a lot of project managers could be that you've, you've kind of seen the movie already, so to speak, when, you, when a project comes in and uh, you know, okay, we're getting to this critical point. You know, we're building a marketplace. There's this critical point we're getting to in the project that, you, that we see in all marketplaces. And here's what we've done at that critical decision point in other projects, you know, this issue the customer had, here's how we fixed it last time. So we're, we're, we're building right now sort of a just-in-time uh, AI assistant that looks at data from past projects and can actually connect a PM with other PMs that have had to go through a similar, a similar mm-hmm. challenge. With development, we, we reuse some code across projects. So uh, we actually, in many cases, we license code to customers instead of sell it. So, uh, you know, we're able to then sort of open source that internally and use that across other, other, other projects if, if we can package it the right way. You know, we talked earlier about how the more projects we work on, the more we're able to, you know, better anticipate costs and timelines for future projects. We have another tool called the supervisor, which we use internally. And this is overseeing all the projects we're doing. So we're doing about 150 projects right now you know, average size, something like one to $200,000. We're able to look at all those projects, watch patterns. Like let's say there's a milestone due in three days. The developer hasn't checked code into GitHub in five days. And maybe the developer and the PM haven't talked over Slack in seven days. It's very likely that we'll miss this milestone, even though we haven't missed it yet. So you can sort of start to predict the future when you've seen enough patterns and you can catch bugs, you can catch lateness before they happen. Some of these technologies are actually fairly mature and in use internally. Some of these technologies are fairly early, but collectively we call these technologies the Gigster platform, and they seek to use data to find economies of scale across roles and across phases of the SDLC, if that makes sense. Spring Framework gives developers an environment for building cloud-native projects. On December 4th through 7th, Spring One Platform is coming to San Francisco. Spring One Platform is a conference where developers congregate to explore the latest technologies in the Spring ecosystem and beyond. Speakers at Spring One Platform include Eric Brewer, who created the Cap Theorem, Vaughn Vernon, who writes extensively about domain driven design, and many thought leaders in the Spring ecosystem. Spring One Platform is the premier conference for those who build, deploy, and run cloud native software. Software Engineering Daily listeners can sign up with the discount code SEDAILY100 and receive $100 off of a Spring One Platform conference pass while also supporting Software Engineering Daily. I will also be at Spring One reporting on developments in the cloud native ecosystem. I would love to see you there and have a discussion with you. Join me. December 4th through 7th at the Spring One Platform Conference and use discount code SEDAILY100 for $100 off of your conference pass. That's SEDAILY100, all one word for the promo code. Thanks to Pivotal for organizing Spring One Platform and for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. You have worked as an engineer at a large corporation. You worked uh, at National Instruments uh, back in the day. I've also worked at a a large enterprise. I I have trouble imagining myself ever going back, partially because I like working for myself, but also partially because I like the freedom of working 
outside of an office. And I think pe- if more people tried that, they would find how preferable it it is in 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 many contexts. And, and you know, unless you're you know you're building your own company, you're building a small company, you're like building Gigster. I'm sure is exciting going into the office. But the, the reason I'm I'm mentioning this is because I'd like to know about the the psychology of the type of people who come on to the Gigster platform to to make their living. Uh, can you describe how those people contrast with somebody who might go to a large corporation like a Google or a Facebook or National Instruments? Certainly. So we we actually designed Gigster from the uh, the developer's perspective first and foremost. We're we're basically a marketplace, right? Customers come to us and they look for engineering resources. And whenever you're designing a marketplace, you need to look at where you have the largest constraint, whether it's supply or demand, you know, and you focus on that constraint, you solve for that and everything else works itself out. You know, so I think it's it's sort of a truism that if we had all the best engineers in the world on Gigster, that we'd have a lot of business, right? So we we asked ourselves, okay, well, how do we solve that problem? Because clearly that's the most important problem. So, you know, granted we're a product for customers and the product is they get software, to, great software built for them, but we're more so a product for our developers and we think very carefully about how we can design what we call a great career experience on Gigster. So from, from the get-go, my co-founder and I asked ourselves the question, what would it take to get us to freelance? Why don't we freelance on Odesk, Elance? Why don't we do it personally? Why aren't we on TopTal or something else? And, and the answer was a couple things. It was you know, some small finite number of issues with all of these freelance solutions that if solved, we, we'd be delighted to work at that we'd del- be delighted to freelance. So one is developers don't want to market themselves. They don't want to do sales. They just want to write code. Two, uh, they want to work with interesting people on interesting problems. They don't often want to engage directly with the client. They like to get specifications in consistent, clear format, right? Versus every single client you freelance with has an entirely different development process, entirely different set of documents. So we created an experience that kind of normalized all of that for them and allowed them to earn a Silicon Valley wage from wherever they work in the world, you know, with interesting people, cool projects, reliable payment, no, no marketing, all that stuff. We solved all those problems and we've attracted some incredible people. Uh, we're in 55 countries. We, you know, 70% US, but 15% Western Europe, 50% other countries, you know, and we've attracted people who, you know, in this sense, kind of in the same sense that, you know, in the same sense that Google has this employment brand where they're the best place to be a full-time engineer or one of the best, we've tried to do that for freelancing. And we've attracted some incredible folks. A number of people from the recent MIT class found out about Gigster because a student was making a lot of money on the platform and they just graduated and became Gigsters. We have a lot of people that moonlight from jobs at SpaceX, Google, Tesla, Facebook, eBay, you name it, top tech company. We have people from that tech company moonlighting. We have a lot of startup founders that are looking to kind of pay the bills on the side. You know, maybe the startup isn't doing that well. They're running low on funding. So we're probably funding more startups right now than, than, than a Silicon Valley VC. You know, and then you have people that just want a different career. Maybe they, they live in the Midwest. They have a family to take care of. They want to code on the beach in Thailand, whatever it is. Um, we're making that possible for people. Yeah, I was just as surprised as other people have been by this. I didn't know how many people actually wanted to freelance didn't realize how much latent demand there was for freelancing, but we started Gigster and, uh, you know, people have come out of the woodwork to participate. So I think there's just a lot of people that want to work in a different way. What's the hardest aspect of scaling the Gigster market? Scaling the marketplace? Yeah. I would say it's a few things. One is project management. Finding great project managers is actually really hard. Whereas we have technology right now that optimizes and augments human project managers, we're by no means replacing human project managers. There's a ton of human coordination. It's been very hard to find people that can help a project run smoothly. We've even seen, we've seen projects that are going terribly wrong. You know, they're buggy, they're three months late, and the customer's happy as a clam because they love their project manager because they get on the phone and crack jokes with them. There's a personal relationship. So there's a very human side to that, which is important. On the engineering side, we haven't had as much trouble attracting great engineers. I think you know, we're, we're highly selective, something like a, a 1% accept rate if you look at the overall pool that, that we consider. Um, 
but uh, you know, once people come in, they're as long as they get work, they're fairly happy and uh, haven't had as much trouble there. Design hasn't been as as difficult. Product management, product management's another bit of a challenge. We've actually migrated the business. You said at the beginning of the call that we serve enterprise. That's relatively new. When we were founded three years ago, we were serving SMBs. We we're doing ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar mobile projects. Now our sweet spot is something between a hundred thousand and several million dollars. So we uh, we're working with different clients that are more discerning, and the people that are that are uh, client facing need to be more experienced, more polished. So you know we're going through a bit of a of a re- of, of a reboot and in some of the roles where we have to recruit different types of people. But uh, I wouldn't say it's I wouldn't say that's a challenge so much as it's just something we have to work through. Was the change from the fifteen to twenty k clients to the 200 to 250 K counts. Was that deliberate or was it, what, what caused that change? In two parts, it was, it, it was deliberate in a way. I mean, we, we recognize that that's what a larger market for software is. And we wanted to, you know, we wanted to have a better avenue to grow our business. So we went after where, where customers were spending more on technology, which is enterprise, which is mid market. It's not as much SMBs. If you think of us like a SaaS business, you know, SaaS is, is great because you, you earn recurring revenue from a SaaS product. You can predict the tenure of a customer. You can predict the lifetime value. With services, it's different. You do have services, you know, you do have services relationships that have lasted for decades. I'm sure there's people that have been using IBM Consulting Group for 20 years, you know, and they've been consistent clients, but it's not as predictable as the ARR that you get from a SaaS business. So, you know, we found with SMBs that a lot of them didn't repeat because they, maybe they ran out of money, they went out of business, or they don't have as much budget for technology. So part of it is we did go after bigger budgets. But the other part is we don't feel good not delivering a product that makes our customers really happy. So what we saw some SMBs and mid-market customers doing was optimizing for kind of a bargain basement deliverable that didn't move their business forward as much as it could have. Whereas if, you know, customers that have budget that's in the six figure range are able to get something that's a much, much higher quality, much more durable product. So we found ourselves wanting to spend more. We actually went into our margin a lot on customer projects. We used to typically make almost nothing on client projects because we would over deliver and just try to give them a better solution until we realized we just had simply had to raise prices in order to deliver a product that we felt proud of. So that was part of it, you know, and then as we raised prices to deliver better products that pushed us into higher markets. So it, you know, it's sort of part organic, part strategic. Mm. This sounds like a really interesting and kind of difficult process to manage. If you were, you know, jacking up the, the quality and then it, that ate away at your margins for the 15 to 20 K deals. And then you said, well, gosh, we're, we can't make money on these. Let's raise the price. But then you, you, it, maybe you, I mean, I, I, it's a, there's a there's an uncomfortable chasm between the uh, fifteen to twenty k deals and the hundred k plus deals. I, I'm just I'm very curious about like the conversations and the kind of like uh, spreadsheet analysis that led to uh, oh, you know we really we really need to like cross the we need to go completely into enterprise. We need to uh, burn the ships, abandon the fifteen to twenty k contracts. Explain like a little bit more what happened behind the scenes. When we raised our Series A, I think this would have been November, December 2015, uh, we announced it and we had $30 million of business come in in a single week. We, we didn't close all that, thank God, because we would have killed ourselves trying to deliver it. And these were, but sorry, we 15 to 20K our, contracts. I mean, it was everything okay. from, you know, 20K to 200K. We weren't seeing anything really much higher than, okay. than that. But it was, you know, five to six figure range, five to low six figure range contracts. And just a ton of them for, you know, from, from, from all quarters, everybody was, every saw the news and, you know, they're like, Oh, I can push a button and hire a development team. Great. So we had a ton of people s- sign up and we took on a bunch of customers and, uh, our delivery operation kind of ground to a halt. We weren't ready for that much demand. We didn't have the supply side quite as, quite as short up as it could have been, you know? So we ended up going to the red on, on a ton of different projects because the invariant for us is we've got to do a good job. We guarantee quality. We guarantee price. You know, whether we go over or not, we'll never charge the customer more. So it was a, it was a stressful time. And we started 
you know, we started inching prices up with sales. We tell them, hey, uh, we've seen that marketplace projects typically go wrong in these few areas. You need to charge an extra 10K, an extra 20K next time. And they said, okay. And they'd say that to customers. And then we noticed something else that would go wrong. And then we'd inch the price up a little bit more. What sales started having to do, because a lot of our customer base back then was still those SMBs, but the prices were starting to starting to rise. What they had to do is they had to de-scope with clients. So clients would say, look, I've only got 50K and I need this Tinder for Dolphins app or whatever. How do I get that done for 50K? And we'd say, well, are you willing to sacrifice this feature and this feature and this feature? So we got into all these dialogues with people about how to, how they could de-scope so that what we actually delivered would be high quality. That worked for a while, but in the process, we had to start looking for new types of customers. And that's where some of our investors helped. And Dreesen Horowitz was incredibly helpful at um, helping us, you know, boot up a bit of a enterprise and mid-market business. We worked our personal contacts and connections from previous large companies we'd worked at. We had to reinvent the company in a lot of ways. And that, as you said, it was definitely an uncomfortable time, but now we're in a much better place where we take on a project, we know we can do a good job. Mm. Have you had to build an outbound sales model? We have. Early days, everything, we thought it would be self-service. I mean, my background is consumer internet. I, you know, I used to work at Zynga. You know, when, when I was managing games at Zynga, I founded a game called Mafia Wars. We would get a half a million new users per day for free. We would just sit there and 500,000 new people a day would come in and try the game. And many of them would stick and many of those would spend money. It was, uh, it was amazing. It was, it was a gold rush. It was a great business to be in. And consumer has that profile. So when I founded Gigster, we had this idea of putting a software development team in everyone's pocket. And we embraced that to the extent that we didn't want a sales team. We actually wanted the salespeople to be freelancers. So I designed and built a freelance sales CRM where anybody could sign up as a salesperson, go through a brief training course, and then they were entered into this sort of round robin queue, like an auto dealership. New customer comes in the door, you stick a car salesman on them, and then that person owns the customer for the duration of the relationship. So we would take these free and salespeople, assign them, and it was all data driven. There was no sales management. We would look at how many seconds does it take you to reply to customer chats? What percentage of customers do you deliver a proposal to? What percentage sign the proposal? And then how, what percentage of them do repeat business and how many of those projects go well? And the idea was we could throw in a thousand salespeople who could work from wherever they want, whenever they want. And uh, we could scale to an unlimited number of inbound leads. Um, unfortunately, those salespeople didn't always act in the customer's best interest. We ended up having to hire salespeople in-house. And then we dismantled the entire freelance-based sales system. We should have packaged it up and sold it because I, I like the idea. But yeah, we originally thought it would be this thing where like, you know, everybody's mom and brothers coming in and building a little app and uh, we couldn't afford sales or our margins would go to zero. But now we we have to go, like you said, we have to go outbound. We have to go direct enterprise. We have to have a direct sales team and a direct sales model. That's how enterprise works. You know, you, uh, you want to come in and help them solve a problem. You need to send in someone who understands partnerships, who can actually, you know, articulate the proposal and get it mm. done. And find the right person to propose to. I mean, who, who are you selling to at a big enterprise? Are you going to the VP of or the CTO and just say, hey, do you have a 200K to throw at a project? Or how do you find the right person with the project? You know, it's we, we, we either come in, sometimes we come in top down, sometimes we come in bottom up. So sometimes, you know, I know or I can get introduced to the, even the CEO of a Fortune 500 or a CMO, a CIO, a CTO. Usually it's one of those executives. Sometimes I come in through board members. Mark Benioff is one of our investors. Um, we've got a, a lot of investors. You know, we have like sports teams, owners as gigster right. investors. So we're able to get intros typically to those executives. And then they'll say, oh yeah, I think we have a couple projects. Let me kick you to the VP of, you know, North America innovation, right. you know, you know, Sarah, talk to Sarah, you know, so we, uh, you know, we, We'll, if we come into the top, we'll then get kicked to somebody who has an actual need. And then we talk to that person about their actual need. And that, that, that decision maker usually has budget and then we can work with them. So what, you know, there's, there's an acronym in sales called BANT, which stands for, stands for budget, authority, need, and timeline. So if we meet somebody who's has the timeline, they're ready to start. They have a real need. They have the authority to actually pull the trigger and the budget to do it. That's ideal. And that doesn't always have to be the same person. Sometimes 
that, you know, multiple people constitute that band that you need to have. But yeah, I mean, our, our sales team essentially seeks that out. And once we find a specific project and all the right decision makers around it, uh, you know, simply deliver a proposal and get mm. them to sign. All right. I know our time is short, but uh, let's close off. Do you have any insights about large enterprises, how large enterprises function these days from your experience selling gigster engagements with them? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll share I'll share a couple. Number one, most large enterprises have their own internal technology teams. Um, so they've built their own mini agencies internally. And oftentimes you're competing against, you know, if you're an outsourcer or an agency, you're competing against this internal agency they have. If they don't have an internal agency, they certainly have an external agency that they've worked with for years. So, you know, oftentimes the right path in is to partner with one of these agencies and, uh, you know, perhaps add some skill that they don't have so that you, can, you both together can create more business. Enterprises are fascinated with new technology. So everybody's interested in AI and machine learning. They see it as an incredibly disruptive technology. The way I would phrase it, and many of our customers would agree, is that AI and ML, this, this technology represents a new trend on the same scale as the internet, in the sense that all business software will be rewritten to accommodate AI and ML, just the way it was rewritten to accommodate the internet. So most of these companies recognize that almost all of their software will be rewritten in the next five to 10 years. And they're looking at the right way to do it. Do I hire? Do I outsource? Do I buy an off-the-shelf product? There's a lot of, there, I'd say there are a lot more questions than answered. Uh, questions than answers, excuse me. There's a lot of interest, a lot of, uh, a lot of passion for technology. It's, uh, you know, it's something that's universal. I, you know, I, I'm based in Silicon Valley and I see a lot of innovation here. I see a lot of great startups, but what I didn't realize until I got into enterprise, the enterprise market is just how innovative enterprises are. One of my favorite parts of my job is getting to meet at executives within enterprises who are innovating. They have cool ideas and they're like, hey, I work at Microsoft or Nike or MasterCard or Starbucks, and we have this incredible asset. And I am I consider myself an entrepreneur. In that case, they're an intrapreneur. And I'm going to take the resources behind me, and I'm going to develop an incredible new product or feature or spin off a new business. So I love finding the executives within enterprise that are the innovators. And they're there. Uh, we might not think that in Silicon Valley. We might have a bias against enterprise, but they're incredibly innovative, incredibly incredibly brilliant executives that are, uh, you know, starting new lines of business. So I love meeting those people and helping them, helping be their technology department, essentially. And I was, I was surprised to see just how much innovation is happening. So th those are, yeah, I'd say, a couple couple insights. I can well, thanks, Roger. Uh, this has been great talking to you, and I, I want to thank you again for coming on Software Engineering Daily. Okay, certainly. Thank you. Great. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash se daily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash se daily. Thanks to Symphono for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily for almost a year now. Your continued support allows us to deliver content to the listeners on a regular basis. Wow! 